Hello and welcome to Politics Europe, your regular guide to the top stories in Brussels and Strasbourg. On today's program, MEPs vote for increases in the EU budget all the way up to 2020. David Cameron says he'll veto anything more than a real terms freeze. So stand by for fireworks. Should the European Parliament stop its monthly trek from Brussels to Strasbourg. We'll report on the latest campaign by MEPs to keep the Parliament in one place. MEPs vote against the appointment of this man to the board of the European Central Bank because of the lack of women at the top. And in the latest in our series, the A to Z of Europe, Adam meets the man who heads the snappily titled Huck Rep. My job is to make sure the UK's voice is heard and that UK interests are promoted uh, and, uh, and protected here. So all that to come and more in the next half hour. First though, this week members of the European Parliament have been meeting in Strasbourg for their regular plenary session. So what have they been getting up to? Here's our guide to the latest from Europe in just 60 seconds. The scene is set for a showdown after MEPs rejected the position of all 27 national governments on next year's EU budget. MEPs voted for a rise of 6.8%. The governments want to limit any increase to 2.8%. But the Commissioner for Budgets said they were ignoring reality. We cannot endorse the Council's decision to cut by, uh, by more than 5 billion our proposal. The appointment of Luxembourg's central banker Eve Mersch to the all-male board of the European Central Bank has angered those who want to see more female candidates for the job. Ever struggled to get compensation for a delayed flight or lost luggage? MEPs agree with you and they've adopted a resolution calling for passenger rights to be enforced across the EU. The European Commission's backed plans for 10 countries to launch a so-called Robin Hood tax on financial transactions. The EU couldn't get all 27 members to agree, but the 10, including France and Germany, want to carry on regardless. That was 60 seconds. With us for the next 30 minutes, uh, I'm joined by Fiona Hall, MEP. She's the Lib Dem leader in the European Parliament. And Paul Nuttall, MEP. He's the Deputy Leader of UKIP. Now, let's just take a look at one of those stories in more detail. The European Parliament vote against the appointment of a man to the ECB Executive Board. Th this is a complaint, which I know Europe's been talking a lot about, that there are just so few women on top boards. Where do you stand on this issue? I think we did the right thing on the vote on the ECB because it has been um, established that actually companies are much better, that they perform much better if they don't just have men on the board. Do they, where's the, where's the, that's interesting. Where's the evidence for that? Th there was a survey done um, oh, survey. just recently. <laughs> <laughs> but of course in the UK, um, mm. over the last year, we've had voluntary measures on getting mm. women onto board since the Davis report, and there's mm. been spectacular process. And the process complaint was that the, e months. the ECB mm. is overwhelmingly male, as I understand, because it's largely made up of the existing central mm. bankers, and they're over, I think, probably all male. I'm not, yeah. Is there a female central well, banker in the Eurozone? Originally, there was a woman on the ECB, oh, and, wow. and she left, yes. <laughs> so it's all and men. Germany is on record as saying that it was always understood that there should be one. Mm. Um, but um, our objection in the Parliament was not that the uh, new appointee um, was a man, but simply that there wasn't even a woman on the short list. On the short list. And we thought that that was really yeah. um, taking well, it too where far. are you on this? Mm. Well, I just, I'm just, I just believe in, in a meritocracy. I think if you're good enough, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, you should get the job. And what is interesting is that uh, Angela Merkel has swung behind this man to get the job today. And the last time I looked, Angela Merkel was a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, Mr. Sarkozy didn't always think that. <laughs> but if you're saying it's a meritocracy, then it follows, therefore, given that the boards and the ECB are dominated by men, mm -hmm. it follows from your argument, logically, in a meritocracy, that it's all men because the women are too thick. And I don't think many people would accept that. Well, you've just got to look... is that right? Well, you've got to look at lead, lead, across the world, there's women, the women in leading positions. You know, the head of the IMF 
is a woman. You know, the Chancellor of Germany is a woman. We've got Hillary Clinton. We have Margaret Thatcher. So why, in this so why no women on the ECB? Well, obviously, because the women who put their names forward weren't as qualified as the men. So I just believe it shouldn't matter what sex you are. It shouldn't matter what sex you are. Frankly, the best person should always get the job. Well, it, it, it clearly does matter because they're all men. What do you say well, to that? I mean, half the population is women. There are more mm. women graduates than there are men. And clearly there is something that's been I, a barrier at the moment. I, and the ECB mm. takes decisions that have effects on household income and living mm -hmm. standards, mm -hmm. which often yes. uh, women bear mm -hmm. the brunt of. I mean, that's the case for having women on the board, exactly. isn't it? Exactly. And if you have a small clique of people, you're going to get a very narrow view of the world. And that's why companies that take women on the board find that they actually um, prosper more, their share price goes up, they perform better. Very and that's briefly. really what it's about. But surely it's demeaning mm. to women, isn't it? I mean, quite frankly, you wouldn't want to be the token woman on the board with other people looking at you thinking mm. that you're only there because you're a replacement. Mm. UKIP is the party that believes women should be cleaning behind oh, the fridge, so I don't think no. that's true. I do remember that story. <laughs> they may have moved on. We'll find out. <laughs> anyway, the stage is set for more fireworks over the EU's budget, and there's a lot at stake. First, this week, the European uh, Commission asked member states to stump up another 6 billion uh, euros. That was simply to help fill a 9 billion gap in the EU's finances just up to the end of this year. Then the European Parliament voted for a 6.8% increase for the budget for next year, 2013, rejecting a lower budget increase put forward by the member states. Now, MEPs and the Council of Ministers now have three weeks to try to reach a compromise. And finally, the much bigger picture, there's the argument over the total budget going forward for the next six, seven years, from 2014 to 2020. They give it a posh name that nobody understands, the multi-annual framework. It's how much they're going to spend between now and 2020. MEPs in the European Commission are gunning for a big budget increase to this MFF, which would mean total spending up to 2020 would be, well, it would add up to more than a thousand billion euros. That's a trillion in my language, whatever that means. But member states have a veto over this. David Cameron has said he'll use his to block any real-term rise in the overall budget. <clears throat> European leaders are due to meet in late November to agree a plan, but the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, has said that the summit should be scrapped if Mr. Cameron doesn't withdraw his threat. So, plenty to talk about here. Let's go to the Spanish MEP, Salvador Garriga Poledo who sits on the European Parliament Budget uh, Committee. Looks like you've got a lot to resolve here for this year, next year, and for the next six years. Um, will you get a settlement, do you think, on all of this? Oof, it's going to be difficult because we start today with the 2012 remaining budget and uh, we got two weeks to come to an agreement on 2013. And at the same time, we are still uh, waiting uh, developments for the oncoming negotiation 2014-2020. It's going to be a very busy uh, three months ahead. I see. I think a lot of people watching will wonder why the European Union should be getting any increase at all when the governments they live under are having to slash their spending like mad. It's happening here in Britain. It's happened in France, even with Mr. Hollande, who's introduced the most steer budget, he described it for 30 years, you will know better than I, it's happening in your own country. National governments are having to cut, so why should the European government, if I can call it that, get an increase? Well, it depends uh, how is the idea about Europe that uh, different uh, uh, politicians have. Uh, the idea is uh, that even in Spain they are slashing the, the annual budget, mm. but at the same time we consider that the European um, budget uh, should uh, incorporate uh, the European added value. Does it mean that the money spent in 27 member states is not so effective as spent at uh, uh, on the European level? At least is the driving idea for the European Parliament. You think that the, the money spent more effectively at the European level than the national level? I mean, you're, the EU's accounts haven't been approved for about 30 years, 13 years now. So how can it be more effective in spending than the Madrid government or the Paris government or the London government? 
Because we, we truly believe that uh, the humanitarian expenditure is going to be more more effective, especially because we are dealing with uh, common agricultural policy, cohesion policy, uh, research, innovation. No, I understand that. Uh, we leave it there, Mr. Gariga uh, Polideo. Thank you for joining us. Um, Fiona, where, what should the British government's strategy, or I'll even narrow it down, tactics be in this European budget formation that we're period we're about to go into? I think it's a mistake to say at the beginning that we might walk out because yeah. there are a lot of um, negotiations ahead and that's not the way you normally go into yeah. negotiations. I agree that in this time of austerity um, it, we shouldn't be looking um, at a, a budget rise um, but we also need to be looking at other, other aspects of the budget. We need to make sure there's a review in there because we all know that we are beginning to come out of recession and in a couple of years then that will be the moment to invest and we also have to make sure that the money that we got is spent more efficiently at the mm. moment you're not allowed to swap money between different headings or between roll different money funds. over to the next year that's um, but, that's stupid but, but just, just to clarify mm. though you, you say you agree that the budget should be frozen in real terms if not for all of the the 2014 to 2020 period certainly maybe for 14 15 mm. and or 16 I think as part of a package where we look at these other aspects as well and make sure that we get the, the proper efficient use out of the money that we do have. And if I could just um, say on the, just I need to yeah, the accounts being um, signed right. off, you know, it's the, uh, it's the, the, the countries of Europe, the, the countries like the UK who are responsible for that. It's the Department of Work and Pensions which has never had its accounts signed off. It's not actually what's no, spent but, at the but European level. you understand level. The, the point I was mm. making, which is that a lot of people have huge huge doubts as to whether money at the European mm. level is spent more efficiently than at the national level, when we don't even think it's that efficient at the national level. Well, Andrew, you said it was 13 years that the accounts that? haven't been signed off. It's 17. Oh, well, there you That's go. I'm behind the it. times. I mean, this is completely indefensible when we've got cuts in our own country and we're living in times of austerity. The European Parliament has basically voted to increase our contributions by two billion a year. It's something we can't afford and it's something I'm sure the people of this country... So what do you think the British government should do? Well, I think that we should just reject it completely. I think that I would like to see the budget reduced significantly. I suspect what will happen is that Cameron will go into negotiation. If you remember a couple of years ago, he got on the train at St Pancras, the Eurostar, and said, I'm going to go over to Brussels, I'm going mm. to be the hard man, we're going to have a freeze. By the time he got off in Brussels, mm. he was prepared to accept a 2.9% increase. Right, so but if he vetoed it, or if he walks out, or if there is simply no deal because they want to avoid a British veto, veto as Chancellor Merkel is suggesting, then you know what happens as an MEP. The budget, this year's budget, is automatically rolled over with a 2% increase. So you get, and there's no veto on that. So would that be a sensible strategy? Well, what Cameron's got to do is he's got to go there and he's got to play hardball. Sure. Quite frankly, if yeah. he has to walk out, I believe he should But then the out. budget goes up. But the, but the budget will go forward anyway. But mm. frankly, but the European up. Parliament wants it to be a 6.8% increase, which quite frankly will take our contributions to 16.3 billion. But I didn't get the answer. So this is a difficult dilemma for the British negotiating position. They, you've got to play hardball, otherwise they just won't play in this country at all. But if you play too hardball, mm. you get the, some mm. of the rise you didn't want in the first place. And we need to remember that we are hugely benefiting from this, particularly when you look at research programs. I mean, Newcastle University has got 116 yeah. research yeah. programs at the moment. If we don't, yeah, we if we have a stop for that. If we weren't making a contribution. I mean, we are net no, contributors. We, no, we're huh? not. Not on research because we no, but overall we're net contributors. If we didn't, I mean, I understand the point that <laughs> yes. been, does mm. give money to that research. Mm. But I'm, I don't quite understand the point of the argument because if we didn't make any contribution at all, if we decided as a nation, as a democracy, we could give that money to Newcastle University anyway, couldn't we? But we wouldn't be in the single market if we didn't do that. I mean, the, the, the recent answer to a parliamentary question is that we pay, the average taxpayer pays eight pence a day. Um, the Norwegian taxpayer, and Norway is not, of course, in the, in the EU, pays almost as much for the privilege of being in the single market. they've got the oil market. they can afford. But, I mean, in the end, although it sounds a big sums, so when you drill it down, per mm. capita, the sums are peanuts. Well, actually, the contributions are quite significant, but beyond that, what you've got to look at is the money which it takes to comply with EU regulations and directives. Now, okay. quickly just to say this, we give 
16 point, we will be give 16.3 billion a year to the European Union. We'll get just under half of that back, and then they will tell us how we can spend our own money. That is unacceptable, and it's wrong. All right, well, I'm sure we'll get that. We're going to have to move on. We've got plenty of time, though, between now and Christmas, I think, as this goes back and back <laughs> to discuss, because it's like endless summits coming up now, Mr. Cameron's air miles. It'll be quite amazing if he carries on like this. How many homes do you think the European Parliament has? I'm sure you know. Some of you may be surprised to find out that it has two. One in Brussels, another in Strasbourg. Now, the moving between the two has been dubbed the travelling circus. And in those austere times, many are questioning if it's sensible or even affordable. Jo Cole packed her bag and she set off to investigate. Brussels may be more famous for its moulfrit, chocolate and beer, but it's also home to the European Parliament, well, most of the time anyway. Once a month, 754 MEPs and 3,000 staff up sticks and trek 220 miles to their other home in the French city of Strasbourg, the official seat of the European Parliament. This tale of two cities and what's commonly, and some would argue rather negatively referred to as the gravy train, could be about to hit the buffers. At a time of economic crisis, the campaign for a single seat for the European Parliament has been gathering speed. Its supporters claim that the monthly Strasbourg shuttle costs up to 180 million euros a year. The round trip, either by car or train, can take up to eight hours and produces 19,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide emissions each year. The public see this travelling circus as an example of EU waste and incompetence. And uh, so the point I would like to make is that the members themselves want change. We recognise what the public feel and we're responding to that by saying, OK, come on governments, stop enforcing us to meet here in Strasbourg. British MEP Edward Macmillan Scott is one of those leading the fight for a single seat based in Brussels and support is growing. In a vote this week, 74% of MEPs backed the call for change. But the decision to base the European Parliament in Strasbourg has huge historical significance. The city is on the border with Germany, and for many it represents the close links between the two countries after two world wars. For us, Strasbourg is a symbol of the peace and reconciliation with, uh, with the Germany and France, uh, so it's um, uh, very uh, uh, strong for us and for uh, Germany also to have the seat of uh, the European Parliament here in Strasbourg. The view of the French is backed up by European law, which states that the Parliament meets in Strasbourg 12 times a year. Changing where European institutions are based requires treaty change, agreed by all 27 member states. History has proved how difficult that can be to achieve. So then the question is, how do you deal with as it were, buying off the French. You have to give them something to compensate and you have to work out ways of using the historic value of Strasbourg in, 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 in different ways. Making Brussels the only destination for Europe's MPs could be many years away. For now, I'd better just book my ticket to come back to Strasbourg next month. Joko there, she actually got the train to the south of France. Uh, can I take it you're both against the two parliament situation? Indeed, um, um, it's crazy. It's the thing that I think most people um, regard as the example of what's not efficient. We need to change it, it doesn't make sense from a money point of view, from the from environmental point anything. of view, or for anything. Yeah, it's um, you, your carbon footprint is enormous exactly going back terrible. and forth. And it made sense originally the, after the Second World yes. War, but it's part of us saying, this is the 21st century and we've got to make the EU work for the 21st century. But I put it to you that even if the whole of the Parliament was united 100%, putting aside the Strasbourg uh, MEP, who probably wouldn't be, it won't happen. No, it won't happen quite simply because uh, I, I think it just shows you how powerless MEPs are on this issue because we will just basically be told that it can't happen because it's written into the treaties. The interesting thing is, you say there's two parliaments, actually there's three. There's one which is mothballed in Luxembourg which has two debating chambers mm -hmm. which have never been used and actually the offices were done up two years ago at a cost of £800 million and there's 3,000 staff there. Well, maybe we could use that for one of our <laughs> shows. I mean, I was interested to learn though that the, uh. f the French don't have another major... You think of the the French being at the heart of Europe, but they actually in 
on French soil mm-hmm. don't have another major European or EU institution. So if, if it was to stay in Brussels, wouldn't Brussels have to send something big down to Strasbourg to fill the gap? There have been many good ideas about what use could be put to that building. Mm-hmm. For instance, a, a technology institute. Disco, um, but nightclub, <laughs> hotel, <laughs> right. like Admiralty Arch. <laughs> <laughs> even though okay. it's absolutely right that we MEPs unfortunately can't do anything about it, um, it is of course in the coalition agreement with the support of both parties of government mm-hmm. um, that we will um, seek to do something about yeah. it. And we need to put it on the table. Yeah. I understand All that right. that will happen. You've both been in favour of reforming the common agricultural policy for a long while too so I wouldn't hold your Watch breath. This space. I will, <laughs> but I won't hold my breath. Now it might look like David Cameron and his ministers are endlessly shuttling between London and Brussels. Well it looks like that because they are. It's for make or break meetings we're told with the EU counterparts. I know it certainly uh, feels pretty tough for them. It's tough for us just to watch and cover. Lots of the groundwork however is done in advance by civil servants who are based in what's effectively Britain's embassy to the European Union, separate from our embassy to Brussels. Adam's been to see this embassy in action for the latest in our series, the A to Z of Europe, where U is for UK rep. In amongst the grandeur of the capital of Europe, where can you find our man in Brussels? Well, here, in between a bar and a pharmacy, this is home to the UK permanent representation to the EU, known in the lingo as UCREP. And the man in the middle with the blue folder full of secrets is our UCREP, our ambassador to the EU. He's the former Treasury official John Cunliffe, the tenth person to have the job. We caught up with him prowling the corridors and lifts of power with his French opposite number. He granted us a rare interview. We're responsible for all discussions and negotiations that take place uh, within the EU. When you think of it, we deal with the whole range of issues uh, which the EU uh, deals with. I started the morning with a, a meeting with the French ambassador and we discussed the agenda of where we are on, on particular positions. Uh, and then I think I'm meeting uh, another couple of ambassadors this evening. And my job is to make sure the UK's voice is heard and that UK interests are promoted uh, and, uh, and protected here. And then he was off to the catchily named Coroper 2, the meeting of ambassadors from the other 26 member states. Here they do much of the EU's day-to-day work. On the agenda, next year's budget, Syria, Iran and immigration. UCREP is also a team of people, around 150 civil servants from across Whitehall. They spend between two and four years here at a time and do the really detailed negotiations. They also help out British guests when they pop over to Brussels, here guiding the Minister Mark Hoban through the complex world of the European Parliament. Critics of this place say it's full of bureaucrats who are in thrall to Brussels, the kind of people who'll do any deal rather than the deal the real number 10 would like to see. While they say they simply negotiate within limits set by London. Oh, and there is some glamour to UCREP after all. It turns out our man in Brussels gets a residence here on Ambassador's Row. I suppose he needs somewhere grand to dish out the Ferrero Rocher. How does he know that? That was our Adam reporting there. Fiona Hall and Paul Nuttall are still with me. Does UCREP, I mean, putting aside your own political point of view, does UCREP do a good job of representing Britain in Brussels? Well, I don't agree with much of what they do. The, the one point I will make about UCREP is that, you know, the Britain represents 12% of the population of the European Union, yet only 4% uh, of the staff within the EU. So they're meant to negotiate on our behalf. Let's, I'm not going to criticise the civil servants. What I will say is that they're taking their lead from the Foreign Office. Sure. And quite frankly, it's the Foreign Office which has sold us down the river they, over the years. They report to the Foreign Office. Uh, give me an idea. What, what sort of thing do they, what's the important thing that they do for the United Kingdom? They don't just report to the Foreign Office. Mm-hmm. They report across the board to departments on, especially across Korea, do that, exactly the, the detailed pieces of legislation. I think they do do a good job, and I work very closely with them from Sir John Do we say high-quality people? 
people there? Yes, we do. We, we had a little gap when we stopped sending fast-track people, but we are doing so again, and that's very important. But, you know, they work on the detail, and they do have their hands tied behind their back because they don't get the full support of um, UK MEPs because there are some UK MEPs who pocket their salary and don't actually do the detailed work on names, legislation. Names. Paul Nuttall has only well, once been uh, in the Environment oh. Committee in the last two years. Well, well, well look, that, mm. that, that, that. I, I don't want mm -hmm. to go down that road, but well, that's another day. I just want to mm -hmm. ask you this. I, I understand you don't agree. We would still have to have, even mm -hmm. if we, you got your way, we weren't in the European Union, we still need an ACREB, wouldn't we? We'd need an embassy to the European Union. If the European Union still existed after we left, of course, we would. But, uh, uh, but but I, I'll just have to answer this question about not sending... You've only got I, would, I would rather have an MEP like myself who votes in favour of Britain and against any oh. sort of legislation that transfers power from our, our country to Brussels. Right. That's what I do, and that's you, why I'm good value for money. You've both had your say. It's fair we are here. That's it for today. Thanks to my guest, the leader of the Liberal Democrats in Europe, Fiona Hall, and the UKIP Deputy Leader, Paul Nuttall. Until the next time for Politics Europe, bye-bye.